Hello guys and welcome along to the stream. We're going to do something a bit different this evening. We're going to start a new vision novel. How's that sound? One in question is this one, Oblivious Garden. Um, actually, let's do something here. Let's see if we can sort out to right edge. There we go. That's uh, that means that uh, the chat can live on the left and. Uh, we won't see, uh, it won't uh, obstruct too much. Now, I had a little look at this one and I think it's going to be very, very silly. Which is just the sort of thing we're looking for really, isn't it? So, let's crack on, shall we? God withdrew his blessings from the land of Latoy. Without those blessings, the prosperity of the past faded into legend. The people of Latoy were finally free to shape their own destinies, and perhaps change the country's name to something that didn't sound like a toilet. But their freedom came at a price of hardships they never could have imagined. Order broke down on the motorway, morality deteriorated. In the chaos that followed, paradise was lost. The final result was an endless war. Latoy is now split into two primary rivals. The northern section of the continent is ruled by the United Principality of Vastra. Good Lord, how do you pronounce that? Vastra. Yeah, it's going to be that from now on. The Empire of Silantru. That's a herb, isn't it? Dominates the southern lands. The wars between these two superpowers and their smaller neighbours never end. Sir Emperor Paraccio, Sir Emperor Paraccio, ruler of Sarandro, rules in his palace, sits in his palace and schemes to restore his people's faith in God by extending his border to the cover all of Latoy. The hero of the people, Erel Reis, is the nephew of the Emperor and a genius tactician. He conquers countless lands in the name of Salantru, the Emperor, and herbs everywhere. Because of Varel's success, his uncle's plans gradually bear fruit, or herbs, as Salantru's army conquers its neighbours. The people's faith in God and the Emperor's divine right to rule grows stronger. With each victory, Arel's fame spreads. Eventually, the entire world stands in awe of his talent. He really should put his trousers on. And Salantru's might. His renown and skill bring a gradual change to Latoy. With each kingdom that is conquered or surrenders to the gifted young general, hope for the end of, to the madness of war grows stronger. Finally, all believe that total victory is within this man's reach. No one who came before him ever succeeded in uniting so much of Latoy. The only remaining opposition to the Empire is its greatest rival, the United Principality of Vastra. At the Emperor's command, Arel Rice. Why does that sound like a Pokemon to me? Rice to Rice to Arel Rice turns his gaze northward and marches on Vastra. Victory after victory convinces the world that not only is this man a genius, but he has the blessings of God upon him, and still no trousers. Even the strongest fortress in all of Latoy, the pride of Vastra, is no match for his tactical cunning. One by one, Vastra's defences fall, its southern border shrinks in conjunction with Cilantro's expanding northern herbage border. Until at last, Arel's rice army stands at the gate of Vastra's capital. This will be the last battle. Night has fallen. Unable to sleep, Harel Rice whittles away the night, staring at the enemy's last fortress and plotting its demise. General, are you going for a walk? Yes, 
This will be the final battle. Can't leave anything to chance. I must be alone to think. I must be sure I haven't missed even the slightest detail. Sir. Oh, wrong voice. Sir, please allow me to accompany you. I will be fine alone. But, sir, scouts have reported that small groups of enemy troops are still patrolling these woods. If I have need of you, I will call. Until then, stay at your post, soldier. I I want to walk with you, sir. I want to bask in your glory and perhaps hold your trousers up. Yes, sir. After bidding the lookouts good night, I walk up the hill behind the campsites. Ah, changed from third person to first. Out here now, okay. Out here, without the campfires to ruin my night vision, the sky is filled with stars. As I stand quietly and gaze up at the sky, I hear a muffled noise from a nearby bush. Shush! Don't, don't, don't make too much of a noise. He's not supposed to see us. If, if you know, if he does see us, he might panic and pull his trousers up. Who goes there? Under the dim starlight, a slim figure jumps out from the bush and flees to the north. You! Halt! I rush forward. Reaching out, I manage to grasp a shoulder. Please, I'm just a refugee. I don't have anything of value left to steal. Don't kill me. You're a civilian? A refugee, you say? Thousands have been displaced by the hardships of war. This woman is obviously one of them. Her voice is hoarse with the kind of terror that can't be faked. What brought you here? I... I'm just fleeing from the war. I don't even know where here is. I just keep running northward. My home was destroyed. I'm just trying to find a place where it's safe to hide. You don't have to be afraid. I'm a soldier and I will not harm you. A soldier, praise God, the army of Thaista has finally arrived to save its people. No, I'm a soldier of Salantru. Looking more closely at the woman with her torn, dirty clothes and her early signs of malnourishment, I can't help but be aware of what the Salantru army has cost the people of this country. <laughs> I don't see Ellen anywhere. Ellen's voice is much deeper. Fear not. We do not harm civilians. Bastard! You're all bastards! You've already destroyed our homes! Now you're saying you won't harm us? Isn't it a little bit late for that? Oh, she does sound a bit Eleni, doesn't it? The woman shouting is growing increasingly hysterical. Her voice is filled with all her hatred, helplessness and hopelessness. It's all your fault! All because of you and that emperor of yours. She throws herself at me with wild abandon. She has no regard for her own safety. General, watch out! The woman is still clinging to my uniform. The guard pierced her body with his sword just as he shouted his warning. Ouch! When the guard heard the woman shouting, he rushed to my aid, stabbing her in the back. Now he pulls his sword out, pushing her away from me at the same time. General, are you all right? I'm fine. She was just... Huh. She's grabbed my ankle. Her fingernails cut through the cloth and bite into my skin. So much pain for such a small injury. She murmurs resentfully, but I can't make out what she's trying to say to me. <coughs> Uh, die. Ha! Not dead yet, eh? With a curse, the guard swings his sword. Her hand, still grasping my ankle, is separated from her arm at the wrist. The guard continues to hack away at her body with his sword. It's not safe here. Look. Look at this person. This person came here and got stabbed repeatedly by a sword. Please return to the camp and rest, General. There's nothing left for me here, alas. All right, let's go back. Don't mind me, sir. I've got some more stabbing to do. 
Stars. Why can't I see the stars anymore? And when will I get this hand off my ankle? The dark of night has given way to the dawn, but the sun hasn't yet risen when Arel Rice commands his army to approach Fyrester's last line of defence. Together they faced one of the most famous strongholds in all of Latoy, Gary Alberg. Went to school with him. This citadel stands in the way of any force trying to move farther north. Its capture will signal the total defeat of the United Principality of Vastra and the complete unification of Latoy. General Rice has positioned the command Pokeball and his officers on the high ground. From there they can observe the enemy troops and the coming battle. As the sun rises, the young Dremel strains to catch the first glimpse beyond the castle walls. But he is shocked by what he sees. The Vastrian nation, whose army has thought to be greatly depleted, has somehow managed to fill the castle with thousands of troops. Worse, the banners beyond the castle walls suggest that tens of thousands more are waiting to be deployed. Could it be a trick? It's hard to make out anything beyond this wall other than the banners flying high on their poles. But is that smoke? Campfires? A lot of them. Not likely a trick then. Let's face it, it would take forever for one person to start all those. Never had a rail encountered an army of this magnitude before. Did Vaisdra conscript all of its citizens out of desperation? They're fighting a battle for survival. An animal is most dangerous when it's cornered. His opponent seems to be betting everything on one last desperate act. Aurel is silent for some time, deciding what this means for his chances of victory while observing the terrain, contemplating action and counteraction. Eventually he starts to snore. It looks like the enemy troops have ours outnumbered, he thinks to himself. This is going to be a hard fight either way. Nothing he can think of will overturn such great odds. The enemy is opening the gates. They're coming out to fight us. Yes, it's me. I was the guard last night. Aurel sighs. Sigh. Too late to back out now, too late for regrets. Aurel descends from his command Pokeball. Joining his troops, he takes a place in the front of the army and draws his sword. <sighs> Supply problems meant they held had swords made out of paper. Listen up, men. This will be our last battle. Well, for those who don't survive, at least. I want you to remember that no man ever won a war by dying for his country. He won it by making the other poor dumb die for his country. I want each of you to fight bravely, but more than that, I want you to word, use words that I can say out loud. I want each of you to survive. Our goal is to return home and rename Vastra to something more sensible. Although they should have been crippled, Vastra somehow managed to master a seemingly endless supply of troops for the final battle. Some of them were aged three, some of them were aged ninety-seven. It balanced out. Aurel brought all his tactical skill to bear on the disaster, shifting strategies at a moment's notice to stem the tide. Although he was successful in repelling countless waves of attackers, the outcome of the battle was a clear to him from the start. After more than a month of bloodshed, the siege of Garberg ended in the defeat of Aurel Rice. What was left of Salantru's once proud army returned home, not in glorious victory as the Empire expected, but hounded by the shame of defeat. Aurel, badly injured in the fighting, was carried to Nurse Joy to no, was carried back to the capital by his subordinates. 
Sorry, sir, I can't help but put my hand on your bottom. It's the only way I can carry you. At the same time, the news of his failure was spread across Latoy. It didn't take long for the fragile piece Arel had carved with steel to devolve into madness Latroy had become accustomed to. The smaller countries that had once surrendered rose in rebellion once more. Many feudal lords, hungry for their share of the now crippled empire, began to carve out new kingdoms as well. The nobility of Salantru condemned Arel. There were calls daily for the Emperor to execute their once beloved hero. But Emperor Paratio ignored the will of his nobles. Through a combination of political and social manoeuvring, he calmed their bloodlust. He publicly denounced Arel, stripped him of his titles and relieved him of command. Then he flushed. Finally, he exiled his nephew from the capital, so that over time the people would forget their failed general. 